Praise the Lord, everyone. Such a wonderful honor and privilege to be in the house of the Lord. Again, you know, it's always wonderful to be in God's house with God's people. If you have your Bibles with you, please turn with me to the book of uh, 2 Corinthians, chapter number 5. We read in uh, verse uh, 17 through 19. Once again, that's uh, 2 Corinthians 5, 17 through 19. <coughs> and while you're uh, turning there and uh, clicking there or, or scrolling there, however you do your Bible, whether it be paper or digital, um, I'm excited to be in the house of God. You know, I know I say that every time I get, get the chance to be behind the, the desk here, but, you know, I am excited to be in the house of the Lord. I just got back in town from a, a Kentucky Missions um, planning session, and what that is is uh, talking about all the different things about starting new churches in Kentucky and all the, the different programs and uh, uh, options that we have available to help those that are planning on doing that. And, um, we had a couple applications to look over about some new works and some great news about some some uh, preaching points becoming daughter works and daughter works becoming autonomous churches and so we've got more th- a lot of great things going on around Kentucky in Kentucky missions and I'm excited to uh, be able to be part of that. Um, so it looks like everyone's got it here. Second Corinthians five seventeen through nineteen said therefore. If any man be in Christ, he is a new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things are become new. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself by Jesus Christ, and hath given given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit, that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their... <clears throat> not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. How many has ever done something wrong, uh, to, uh, or really, 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 really dumb or stupid to somebody close to you, and caused damage to the relationship, caused harm to that relationship there? Uh, you get that gnawing uh, uh, in your stomach, that regret, that anger, that remorse, Frustration, uh, the the uh, feeling deep inside, very very deep inside. Uh, there is no feeling like having alienated someone close to you, someone that matters to you. Thank you very much. But also on the other side of things, there is no feeling like being restored to favor to someone important. So you know, you, know, you get that that terrible terrible remorse when when it's messed up but when things get right there's the, the there's this amazing amazing joy that takes its place um, <clears throat> i'm very thankful that i've experienced the very very sorrow for my sin and my not good standing with god that made me recognize that i needed to get right with god and then i got that replaced with the joy unspeakable that is full of glory you know, uh, we can relate how, how that, that feeling from when we have our natural relationships also to how we experience that change in our lives when we truly come to God. Uh, in our scripture, it's talking about restoring favor with God. Being put into an upright position, being put into a right relationship again. And Paul tells a wonderful story in, in this, cha- the, this the ending of the chapter here and in the, the beginning of the next chapter, tells a wondrous thing about getting right and staying right with God. Our scripture here, Paul told the Corinthians that when we are in Christ or when we're born again, and just to be clear, for, 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 uh, that means you know when we've repented of our sins, We've been water baptized in Jesus' name and received the gift of the Holy Ghost when we've been born again. We become a new creature, having all the old things passed away. 
they're still going to be around. There's going to be elements of those old things. There's going to be uh, uh, tendencies to want to go back to the old things. There's going to be temptations and things trying to draw us away. But we have power over those old things, and all things are become new. But not only new, but they're becoming of God. See, the things that were in your life before can die and be buried as long as you let them. Amen. And then all the new things are of God. You know, whereas, you know, we, we sought for one bottle, amen, now we just seek, uh, seek for his spirit. You know, when we sought for uh, some pleasures, now we just seek, uh, for, uh, seek after pleasing him. You know, letting the master be glorified. And then in return, we get the joy unspeakable and full of glory. <clears throat> Such a wonderful thing. You know, uh, all these things become new. But Paul also points out to the, the fact that God has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ. It's not us that makes the, 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 the whole process happen. I can't make myself better. But I can let God work in me to bless me and make me better. I want to bless God. I want to bless God and become better every single day. I want to get closer to Him at every opportunity. He reconciled us to Him. He changed the balance sheets, as it were. But what is reconciliation? Anyone have a clue what that means? An accountant will tell you it, it means to balance the sheets, balance, balance things. Uh, 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 what, what gives a common misconception amongst us today usually is that we think that if we do enough good that outweighs the bad and we can balance it ourselves that way. But that's not what reconciliation actually means. When we're coming into balance with Christ, that means we actually get rid of the bad things and uh, uh, add more to the good. Uh, and it's not about uh, trying to do more good than bad. I mean, that obviously is part of what we do, but that's not the end factor. It's, not, it's more about pleasing Him, to be uh, brought into favor with Him. Because... Uh, even if you try to do good and then you, you, you go after and you, you try to do a little bad, just make sure you do a little less bad than good, that's not having favor with God. It's all about getting favor with him and staying in favor with him. In other words, it's bringing uh, to right standing, having right attitudes, right action, right words uh, towards the God and the things of God. It's bringing us into that place to where we can be new each and every day. It's about going after God with our whole hearts. Being blessed of Him each and every day. In essence, the ministry of reconciliation is to bring people into right standing with God. You know, God brought us into right standing, and it's up to us to go seek others to bring them into right standing as well. It is our purpose to continually... Seek after Him. It's not about what I can do for myself. It's not what I can do for other people, really. It's about what God can do for us or through us that will bless the world today. It's about trying to get right with God and get others right with God. That is reconciliation. We are trying to seek after the King of Kings in every aspect of our lives. Everyone who has become a new creature in Christ has this ministry. We all have to be reconciled unto God. But we also have to reach out to others. Uh, that through our words and our deeds that we draw people in to that right standing with God. This is the first aspect of, of the ministry of reconciliation. That we do our part to get people to God. Right? We try to help them reconcile. We tell them the word. We tell them this. We tell them that. But there's also a second aspect of this ministry of reconciliation. And this is an ongoing practice of reconciliation that's not just about bringing them to God, but it's bringing them to us. You know, we, can ha we can't have a great relationship with God if we don't have a good relationship with our brother. 
You know, we can't, we can't say that we're all righteous and holy if we've got hatred or malice towards someone else. Or if, or if we're constantly adding to the fuel of their hatred or malice. You know, we have to do our part to reconcile not only ourselves to God, but ourselves amongst each other. We have to be reconciled. If we truly are the temple of the Holy Ghost, and if we're truly the body of Christ, as Paul has stated, a couple of times throughout his epistles, then this ministry of bringing people into the right standing of God is not just a vertical thing. It's a horizontal thing. You know, we've heard it multiple times before. You've got to get this right and have this right. And then you can have the true effect in your life. I cannot reconcile someone to God without reconciling them unto the body, which is the church, which includes you, which includes me. You know, I can't reconcile someone to God if I'm going to run them down. I can't reconcile someone to God if there's going to be a fight between us. Or I can't try to uh, uh, reconcile someone to God if there's going to be a fight amongst them and someone else. You know, we, we have to tear down the, any type of opposition to someone coming to God. We have to do our part. I can't do your part. You can't do my part. But we can all do our own parts. Amen. Uh, if I'm to show them Christ, I'm to show them Christ in me. You know, if I want them to see God for who he is, I have to live like he is who he is. I have to talk like he is who he is and, and live like he is who he is. Amen? Uh, Paul said, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. You know, we have to do our part and let God move in our lives. We have to do that part. See, in fact, Paul flows from our opening verse that we read already to, into the next chapter by describing the importance of us talking or taking the fact that we have received reconciliation and grace seriously. We have to take it seriously. And, and he, he explains that by con, how we conduct ourselves in a way that doesn't discredit that. Because I can say I am this and God is that and that this is this and this is that. But if I don't live that, what am I doing? I'm making, uh, I'm being a hypocrite, right? Uh, I'm making, I'm saying one thing and doing something contrary to it. It's a, do as I say, not as I do. I mean, who's going to follow someone like that, right? Amen. Uh, it, that's not the way this is meant to be. And in 2 Corinthians 6, verses 1 and verse 3, I want to look at it here. It says, we then as workers together with him. Now see, that's still in in, um, in a context of reconciliation, we're working with him in reconciliation. It says, I beseech you. And that word beseech there means to entreat or to emphatically urge. This isn't like, hey, Brother Lonnie, could you do this? It, it's more of a, oh, Brother Lonnie, please, oh, please, oh, please, could you do this? You know, it's a begging, it's a, it's a entire, it's a, an emphatic, emphatic urging and and, and request being made unto someone. It's not just a, if you get around to it, could you do this? Amen. It, it's not like if I was to ask Brother Lonnie something, it would be like if one of the, the great grandbabies would say, say, can I have this? And, and they say it in just the right way because they know exactly what they need to say and how to say it, right? And that's what uh, Paul's talking about. I beseech you, I, I, I'm trying to do what I need to do to get you to do what you need to do here. It says, to beseech you that you also, also that ye receive not the grace of God in vain. Hey, I want to make sure I encourage you to not receive the grace of God in vain. That means if you receive the grace of God, please live it. Please experience grace to its fullest. Don't turn back to the muck and mire. Don't turn back to sin. Don't turn back to all the problems and the situations that this world has to offer. Stay with it. Stick with God. Do what God has for you. O open the door. Walk through the door that God opens. You know, close the other doors that uh, would lead you out, and but just follow after him no matter what. That is what he's talking about here. And then verse 3, giving no offense in anything that the ministry... And that word ministry there is not talking about just a group of people, uh, not just talking about the pastor, bishop, or the elders, or the apostles. Uh, it, it's talking about the practice or the action of doing 
ministry so that the, the action of ministry be not blamed or discredited. Meaning that if, if I was to go down to the jail and try to minister down there, and then I start cussing like a sailor to them, is that going to do, any fa- is that gonna, uh, do up, upright for things for them? Is that going to help them show them the way more perfectly? Is that going to help them sh- see the right direction? No. They're going to say, I'm, I'm no better than they are. You know, why would I want to listen to you about your God if, if God doesn't change you at all, right? It's about going after, trying to not discredit the ministry, trying to not discredit the things that God can do. If I want to say that God's a healer, but then I never come to an altar and ask for prayer for healing when there's a problem, or if, if I ever say that uh, you know, God's a deliverer, but I, I refuse to ask God for help to be delivered from some things, you know, my actions must align with my words. We must ex- exercise extreme caution so that this great ministry of reconciliation is not discredited through our own offensive behavior. Um, what's he saying here? He's saying that our actions can credit or discredit the message of the favor of God and the favor that we've been entrusted with. We have to do our part. We have to live righteous and holy and upstanding, not just before God, but amongst the people. You know, I, I, I remember years ago that there was some, some folk that uh, they would dress the, the part. They would talk the part. But my goodness, they would not act the part. They would say, tell you how much holier than you that they are. They would tell you about how, how much better that they are uh, now because God came into their lives. But they, they acted self-righteous instead of acting uh, uh, with love and, and extending grace and mercy to others. And, you know, people can see that and people can tell when you're real and you're sincere or if you're insincere. You know, and when, when people like that try to come at you and try to tell you, well, there's a better way and you need to get better. Well, if you're being fake about it, why would I follow that? That's why our actions have to uh, actually align with our message. <clears throat> uh, verse 4 there talks about, but in all things approve ourselves as, as the ministers of God, or uh, in all things exhibit ourselves, do the things properly. You know, We have to do our part. And here are uh, some steps to upholding the ministry of reconciliation in our lives. The first one here would be patience. We see it in uh, ver- the verses here. Uh, I'll read it in just a second. But patience in, is uh, in the face of adversity. Cheerful endurance. Consistency. Now, patience doesn't just mean, well, I'm waiting. You know, a lot of times when we hear the word patience, we just think, uh, I'm waiting. Waiting around for a little bit. That's, but that's not what it's talking about here. It's talking about cheerful endurance and consistency. Now, that's not saying, oh, great, another problem. Oh, great, another problem, and being super happy about there's another problem. No, it's having, and I'll get in more into this in a second, it's, it's having the right a- attitude about it and having a track record that you're enduring the, the, the situation and consistently pushing through and persevering even though it can take a while. Uh, 2 Corinthians 6, 4 through 5, talks about approving ourselves, as the, or approving ourselves as the ministers of God in much patience, in stripes, in imprisonments, in tumults, in labors, in watchings, and in fastings. Patience, again, speaks to the track record of consistently enduring all types of the situations and the examples that are given right here about being beaten, having stripes, being imprisoned, and the tumults of having instability or confusion tossed about you, the labors and having the sleeplessness and all the mess and the muck and the mire that comes all around us, but yet we still enduring. That's having patience. It's enduring that long suffering. Amen. Uh, In Luke 21, Jesus described all sorts of uh, hardships that believers would endure, and we will endure them sometime or another. But in verse 19, he says, in your patience, possess your souls. In other words, you keep in your soul by keeping your track record of overcoming, that you keep going on. You keep on keeping on, as the old saying goes. You know, you keep pushing through. You persevere. You endure. You have the long suffering. It's not just I'm waiting, it's I'm making it. may not always be the greatest time, but I'm going to make it. And uh, through standing firm and enduring cheerfully, 
And again, again, that cheerful, it's not just about, yay, another problem, yay, another circumstance, yay. No, it's, it's about not complaining about it, not degradating. It's like uh, not, being, uh, not being dramatic about it like, like a little toddler would, you know. Not say, oh, God, another thing. Oh. It, it's about, you know, it's like, well, not saying that you can't say something about the problem. It's not, not saying that you won't get down about it a little bit, but, but enduring and saying, you know what, God's got this. Not constantly staying and pushing yourself to the point of anxiety and, and depression and, 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 uh, and just running at the mouth about every little thing. It's about enduring through the process. And when you endure that and when people see you going through the storm and still enduring with a smile on your face, even though there might be some, you know, some storms behind the smile, They'll see something of God in you and be able to say, you know what, I want what you've got. And that's part of that reconciliation. We're showing them that God has peace in the midst of the storm. Not saying that there won't be storms, but showing that there will be peace in the storm. Our ability to remain uh, cheerfully consistent is of great importance in drawing people to Christ. The second one is purity. And we see that in, uh, again in verse 6, that, that state of being clean. Presenting ourselves as ministers of God by purity. I cannot be a suitable minister of the favor of God if my life does not reflect the cleanness that that should bring. What am I saying? Well, let's look at uh, Titus uh, 2, uh, 11 and 12 for that. For the grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to, to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lust, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. That means if I want to be pure, I'm going to have to live pure. I'm going to have to deny this world. I have to do my part. You know, everyone has to do their part. We all are tempted. We are all tried. We all face the same temptations. But it's up to us to do our part to overcome. In other words, if we, we need to be pure in our talk, pure in our actions, Pure in our reputation uh, matters and appearance matters, you know, because some people will see where we go. You know, uh, there, there's another th scripture in there that talks about let not your good be spoken evil of. You know, you don't have the, the, the or also abstaining from the very appearance of evil. You know, you got to be in the right place at the right time. You know, uh, you might be innocent. Uh, Brother Smith used to tell a story how he, uh, he needed a phone, and this is back before, you know, cell phones. And he went into a store that happened to uh, have a phone. It just happened to be a liquor store, right? So when he comes out and he trips over the ledge, someone saw him stumbling out of the liquor store. And uh, word got around, oh, that new convert is doing this, this, and this. He's also stumbling out of the liquor store. So this and this. Well, you know what? That's, you know, everything might have been on the up and up, but the appearance is what was wrong. So we have to do to make sure our appearance is pure because we don't want to let other people have the wrong intentions. You know, and I get that, that sometimes that's just, they're going to have the wrong intentions no matter what, or the, the wrong uh, mindset no matter what about what's going on. And they're going to make their own assumptions of what's going on. But we have to do our part to be pure and be blameless above that. Uh, we have to be pure in our thoughts and pure in our motives. We cannot have ulterior motives when we're dealing with people because people will see through it. It may not be the person that you're dealing with directly, but people around them. Someone will see it, and they will be able to, you know, uh, call you out on that. And, and maybe they won't, won't actually call you out, but you will have lost for good. That they will have shut you down because they can see that there's uh, something that's not very pure going on. <coughs> Third is the, the knowledge of, uh, uh, and slowness to avenge wrongdoing. Uh, tie that into uh, another phrase for long suffering there. You know, not retaliating against that. Because we have to realize that we are going to get criticism in this world, no matter what. Some of it's going to be very, very strong criticism. And we have to realize that much criticism that we receive is really not about us. It's not about what you've done. It's not about who you are. Some, most, a lot of times, it's about them. Their jealousy, their envy, their bitterness, anger, fears, or pain, frustration, or misconceptions that they turn around and throw back to you. 
Uh, uh, not to say anything political, but if you follow any political thread anywhere in, or any political conversation, you will see this play out. At some point, they'll, they'll, stop, they'll ignore whatever the topic is, and they'll go after people, whether it's true or not, they will go after various perceived things. You know, and, and, and that just happens over and over again because they don't understand what really is going on and they just want to try to win the argument or win the battle there for the sake of just winning. What we have to realize is that you know, sometimes the, the accusations will come and the, the, the criticism will come, but it's not really you and it's not yours to try to fix. You just say, you know, let's take this to God. Let's take this to the altar. Because by understanding this, you're less likely to build a wall between you and the offending party. Uh, rather, we seek all means to tear down walls, you know, between people. You know, because <clears throat> if I keep, try to keep you at arm's length or build up a wall or however you want to put the phrase there, you know, th that's separating our relationship. And if I separate the relationship, you know, I might be separating you from the only Jesus that you'll ever see. We, that's the mindset that we realize when we're dealing with people in this world. Sometimes there is a time to keep them away and far, far away. But, you know, we can't build walls just because we're uh, of, of, of bitterness or because of anger or fear or frustration. We have to, uh, you know, do things in a biblical order because we have to try to reconcile ourselves with God, but we want to try to win them over as well. We need to try to look past hurtful behavior of others and seek to minister to the injury. What's causing them to really lash out like that? Why is that person so adamantly against this? You know, I heard a story about uh, someone who uh, claimed to be uh, an avid atheist. When, you know, when, when in reality they were just mad at God because God didn't do uh, X, Y, or Z person wanted done years ago. And so they would always attack anyone that had any form of, of, of that religious, uh, of any, any religious persuasion, but specifically those of apostolic faith because that's what they knew when they were growing up. And they, something happened, and it was against what they wanted, and they used that as the launching pad for attack. So we have to really sometimes seek after and say, you know what? It's not them. It's not me. It, it's about restoring right relationship with God. It's, it's not about, it's about us doing what we can to seek to minister to the injury. Because some people will never uh, overcome things by themselves. They need help. You know, sometimes there's a casual conversation. Or bringing things from, you know, instead of cranking it to 11, you know, take it back down to 1, you know, if you can. In that conversation, you know, actively trying to heal and reconcile them instead of trying to blast them with both barrels. And with, we have to have, uh, number 4 would be, Kindness and sincere love, uh, as the scripture says there, and kindness by the Holy Ghost and by unfeigned love. This ties into the previous one a bit because we have to exhibit love and kindness when dealing with those people. And it must be a universal thing, not an exclusive thing. We cannot pick and choose who we love. Anyone that walks through this door needs to be able to feel the love of Jesus. We don't pick and choose who comes through, who we're going to love out of those that come through. We love everybody that comes through these doors. Likewise, when we're out there trying to invite people in, don't pick and choose who you want to invite, amen? Let God lead and guide you, amen, and love everybody, amen? Because if it's exclusive, it's insincere. They'll pick up on it. Others will pick up on it again, and, and we don't need to pick and choose. We're not the inspectors. God is the one that takes care of that. Uh, Romans 12 and 9 says to let love be with without insincerity we have to love truly every person that comes here not just a fake smile hey how you doing and then mosey on you know just you have to show the love and that's not just those that come in here but in, in your workplace in your home you have to love sincerely you know i get sometimes where it feels like you're just putting on a fake facade and and just uh going through the motions but sometimes you just need to go through the motions until you can rejuvenate yourself in the Holy Ghost, you know, get some time alone to pray, amen, and get right with God, and then that love will be renewed, amen. That love will be able to be ex uh, shown outward again in greater, greater detail. You know, we have to love 
God and love people. If we truly ever want to say we love anything, if we don't love God and love people, we're not really loving. Amen. We need to show true love towards others. Uh, and uh, the final one here would be truthful words. It's found in verse number seven there. The word of truth or in truthfulness speech. We show that we approve ourselves as the or we prove ourselves as ministers of God and how truthful we are in our communication. Thou shalt not bear false witness. Anybody remember that one? Amen. In other words, don't lie. But not just that. Be honest and up up front sometimes. I get sometimes you don't want people to know everything that's going on and that and that's fine. But don't lie. <laughs> Amen. Don't uh, tell a half-truth because as the old saying is, a half-truth is a whole lie. Nothing undermines our effort to reconcile the world unto us and to the, and to, the, to the Lord like dishonesty. Truthful words demonstrate our integrity and reliability. And this weekend, I heard a lot of different things because we were going through not just uh, the great things that are going on in but uh, a lot about the, the daughter work processes and the church planning processes and all the just witnessing and outreach processes. And I, I got a lot of great notes for, for, for out, of, out of this weekend. But one of the wonderful quotes that I had out of this was simply, you will never be able to win them to your God and they will never be able to trust your God if you can't win them to you or if they can't trust you. If, they, if I can't trust you... What makes me think I would trust your God? Because you're supposed to become like what you worship. Amen? You know, and you can tell that, that people do become like what they worship. You, uh, it, you want proof of that? Just walk down any street and you'll see uh, all the kids in their, their preferred sports players' outfits because they want to be just like that person. I don't want to be just like LeBron or, uh, or, or just like... Um, I don't even know any other ones right now. <laughs> Sorry. I don't want to be just like uh, uh, the latest uh, Bengal. I don't want to be just like the latest uh, UK ball player. I don't want to be like the, the, the latest whoever. I want to be like Jesus. So they need to see Jesus in me. Amen. I need to become like him in my integrity, in my walk. And when they see, again, like the verse said before, it's not Christ. It's not me that lives. It's Christ in me. Amen. It's, it's that we become more and more like him and see that. And if they're not seeing that, we need to evaluate ourselves and say, why aren't they seeing that? Amen. And we need to evaluate ourselves and say, where's my integrity? Where's my reliability? Where's my endurability? Where's my uh, trust at? What am I seeking after that's not him that lets them not see that in me? So we have to have integrity. That is one of the most important things that we have. And um, briefly, and uh, I'm going to go over four integrity busters that we need to eliminate if we want to truly be able to reconcile others unto God and to make sure that we're reconciled unto God. The first one here would be flattery. A compliment most unsincere. Uh, saying that you, uh, something that you don't mean just because you have an ulterior motive. Uh, the reason that this discredits the ministry of reconciliation is that you will actually reveal your true feelings to someone, thus showing your dishonesty. Again, we must be real. Uh, there's a big buzz phrase for a few years of being authentic and real. And while those are the, that was so appealing for some that went off in an, another direction, it's because we do need to be authentic and real, but we need to be in grounded in the truth with that we have to be real in our approach to god and real in our approach to people uh, I, I can't tell you how many times i've gone to a, an event or something where someone's just wanting my money and, and long before they ask hey how do you how, how are we going to take care of this or uh, ask for the pledge offering or this that or the other they go into this lovely long list of platitudes and this that and the other trying to win me over first that way before they get into my wallet Many times over, and that's how it is. It's like, how can you, how can, what can I say to you to help you uh, uh, give me your money or give me your influence, give me your, your favor there? How can I use you? What can I say to make me use you, essentially? We can't be like that. We can't not 
be flatterers in that motion. And we can't have unfulfilled commitments, which is number two. Uh, Matthew 5, 36, 37. Neither shalt thou swear by thy head, because you cannot make one hair white or black. But let your communication be yea, yea, and nay, nay, for whatsoever is, is more than these cometh of evil. You don't need a contract, in other words, to, to uh, can't, can't be swearing by this or making contracts by that to show that you're going to do a commitment. If you're going to do something, your word should be good enough because you, you have a track record of fulfilling it. You know, if you say you're going to do something, do it. It's very simple. Um, it's a shame for a Christian to ever renege on a promise, to ever go back on what they say. If you say you're going to do it, do whatever you can, all of your power to be able to fulfill that promise. We must have our commitments fulfilled. Number three, double speak. Again, that kind of goes back to a little bit with lying, but it's saying one thing to one person and a different thing to another. The, one of the greatest problems with this is that it will cause division. It will cause disunity, and it will discredit the unity that God has called us all to be a part of. And if we ever want to have right standing, we have to have unity. We have to have unity. 1 Corinthians uh, 1 and 10, uh, the church is told to all speak the same thing. Let there be no divisions among you, that you may be perfectly joined together in the same mind and in the same judgment. We have to speak the same thing. We have to be of one mind. We have to have unity. And the fourth one there is, that's a, a, that is an integrity buster is unwillingness to accept our reconciliation responsibilities. We refuse to do our part, essentially. Uh, Matthew 8 and 15 uh, through 16 talks about, you know, what you're supposed to do if a brother offends you, you know. It doesn't say ignore it. It doesn't say treat them uh, badly. It says, no, go to them. Take care of the problem if you can. And if they don't uh, listen, you know, then you take uh, witnesses. And, you, know, you, you try to resolve it. You do your part. Hebrews 12, 14 talks about follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord. A lot of people focus on that verse about the holiness part, but uh, the important part there is peace. We need to be peaceable. If I can't say that I'm holy if I don't have peace, if I don't try to treat my brother with respect and love, I can't have holiness if I don't have that peace and not being peaceable. We have to be willing to make relationships right, if all possible. We have to do our part. We have to live peaceably. Uh, one person said it this way, it's not about what's happening to you, it's what's happening in you. What's going on on the inside? Do you have the right attitude about the problem? Do you have the right attitude about the situation? Are you addressing this peaceably or are you doing it in anger and frustration? We got to do our part. We must do our part. A person uh, who knows who they are and stands their ground in gratitude faithfulness to God in the good times and they will also stand in commitment to God in the bad times it's like I, I say often it doesn't matter if we're on the mountain high or in the valley low praise him serve him love him but not just that but love them serve them all, the, all those that are around you uh, <coughs> in closing I'll invite pastor Lead us on in prayer and whatnot here. God has given us this great pr privilege of being involved in the ministry of bringing others to him. You know, we have this great privilege to be part of the ministry of reconciliation, but we've got to do our part. Uh, the way that we do this uh, sh to show uh, the effects of reconciliation in our own lives. If I want to win someone, I need to be shown that I've been one myself. I want to right relationship with God, and that requires having a right relationship with my brother and my sister in the house of God, and with those that I encounter on a daily basis. I have to do my part to help make things right, and it starts with making me right. It starts at an altar. It helps, you know, I can't approach them unless I've approached him first. I have to be led and guided of his spirit, and if I'm not you know, right with him, I'm not going to know where his spirit is leading. I need to do what's right. I need to get into an altar that I can help win them and bring them to an altar. Because at the end of the day, we all need to come to an altar. 
We all have to come before God and say, you know, and address things here before, while we still have a chance before the final judgment comes. I want to make my part and do my part and be reconciled unto God, but I want to try to reconcile as many others as possible in the process. I want to have right relationship, not just with God, but with each and every one of you that is in this place today. I want to be right with all of us so that we can have the right ministry together. We can grow together, and Lighthouse Ministries can truly be the church that God has called us to be. Amen. Amen. Shall we stand? Thank you, Brother Travis, for the word here today. Amen. Brother Travis has challenged our hearts here this morning. Amen. The question is, what says you? Ultimately, when the word goes forth, it's up to us to do something about it. Amen. It's up to us to either receive it, believe it and receive it, or doubt it and do without it. Amen. It really is. It's not a hard thing. It's an easy choice. Amen. But the reality of it is, most like anything in church, a lot of times it's a lot of gut checks because it's constantly, you constantly have to keep battling this. The battles of this flesh is sometimes very difficult sometimes. Amen. But if we're ever going to get anywhere in God, if a church is ever going to grow, or even or if you're ever going to have any personal growth, amen, you're going to have to battle your flesh. Amen. You're going to have to battle things. Amen. Uh, flesh battles are not always just things that are temptations. Amen. Sometimes it's stubbornness and dealing with things that we deal with that we're just stubborn dealing with. And I appreciate Brother Travis. He's been teaching this morning here. And I want us to lift our hands to the Lord this morning, shall we? They're going to be coming up here shortly. Uh, it's about that time for them anyway already. Amen. We appreciate everyone this morning. Amen. But let's just call upon the Lord here, shall we? Father, we love you here today. Lord, we thank you for the word that has gone forth here this morning. Lord, we give you praise and blessing and glory and honor, Lord God. Lord, let us take this word, Lord God, and let us apply it, Lord, to us here today, Lord God. Lord, we want to have integrity, Lord God. We want to have integrity with you so that people might trust us, Lord God. Lord, we want to be, have integrity, Lord God, in our own hearts, Lord God. Lord, to have integrity, Lord God, that people might see us, Lord God, in a way that someone they can trust, Lord God, that we might be, Lord God, the person, Lord God, that leads them to you. Lord, we ask right now, Lord God, that we might obtain credit with you, Lord God. Lord, we know, Lord Jesus, we of ourselves are nothing, O God, but we need you this day. We need you to help us, O God, not to double speak or, amen, or to be untruthful, Lord God. Lord, we're just praying today, Lord God, that we, amen, uh, Lord, uh, to, to help us, O God, to overcome the things, O God, that hinder our growth, O God, whether it be personally or even as a church, O God. Lord, I just pray for your power and glory. Mold us and shape us into something you can use each and every day. Something greater than we were yesterday, Lord God. And help us here today to fulfill, Lord God, your, your calling and your desire in our life. Lord, not only that, but we ask that your will will be accomplished in each and every one of us this day. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen, amen, amen. Praise God. The children will be coming up any minute.